ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our uh, post-election uh, live stream. I'm going to talk a little about, a bit about the election results in minutes. I'll wait until the audience builds up a little bit first, uh, so don't miss too many people. But we do have a special guest tonight, Mike Buchanan, uh, who is uh, a men's rights activist and an anti-feminist, who might describe himself. So we're going to have a chat about uh, feminism. I think we might uh, agree about quite a few things. We might disagree about uh, how to say them in some cases, but uh, we shall see. We shall see. We had a, a debate about marriage a few months ago now uh, that was quite sparky, shall we say, quite entertaining. So, uh, yeah, Mike will be with us shortly. Uh, but first, I'll go through a few things that have been in the news. Uh, the first thing I thought I'd mention, uh, Margaret Sanger, pioneer of the contraception, but in particular abortion uh, movement uh, in America and around the world. I thought it was you know, pretty common knowledge that she'd been found to have racist views, the various quotations from her that showed she had uh, had racist views. And I mentioned that. It was maybe in a live stream a while ago or in a video. I mentioned it, and someone emailed me saying, actually, that's not right. Uh, that's based on uh, quotes out of context. So, okay, right, that's interesting. So I uh, had a look into it, and I'll tell you what I found. Uh, two quotes seem to be the centerpiece of the case for saying that Margaret Sanger... Uh, was racist. So here's the first one. Um, on the other hand, the mass of ignorant Negroes still breed carelessly and disastrously, so that the increase among Negroes, even more than the increase among whites, is from that part of the population least intelligent and fit and least able to rear their children properly. Now, people present that as though she was saying that it's the Negroes generally form this part of the population. Uh, but I haven't looked into it. Uh, that's not what she was saying. She was saying that what she saw as the good service of preventing the least intelligent and fit population uh, section of the population from reproducing, that good service had been provided to white people and it also needed to be provided to black people as well. That's what she was basically saying. Um, so she's definitely uh, guilty of eugenic thinking. There's no doubt about that. I'm guilty as charged. Uh, but that quote isn't actually shown any sort of racial bias. And the killer quote that you often hear, I've, I've heard it a few times, is this one. So she said, we do not want word to go out that we want to exterminate the Negro population and the minister is the man who can, who can straighten out that idea if ever it occurs to any of their more rebellious members. Now that gets quoted in a way as if she's saying we don't want them to realise that we're out to exterminate them. We don't want them to. We are out to exterminate them, but we don't want them to realize that. Uh, but if you look at it in context, it, she wasn't saying that at all. She was fearing that uh, the black people might see it in that way, even though it's not true. They might see it uh, in that way. Um, so I thought that was interesting. So we always need to be uh, careful with our own side as well. I mean, that um, looking at this sort of pro-life websites, pro-life activists. I mean, that misinformation basically was, was out there quite commonly. Now, if someone wants to give me the next chapter of the story and tell me I'm missing some or I've got the wrong end of the stick, then, uh, you know, email or put it in the comments and we will have a look into it. But we always need to be careful of our own side. Don't assume that everything that comes from people who are basically on your wavelength is going to be accurate and uh, you know, presented in the most honest way. Because in that case, it seems to me uh, that it wasn't. So... Learn something every day. Right, next little story for you. Uh, our Dr. Colin Morrison, the man who wants to break down the barrier between childhood and sexuality, and therefore got the job of uh, producing sex education resources for use in uh, Scottish schools. I wrote to the Scottish government uh, a couple of months ago now, saying uh, this person is not suitable for the job and he shouldn't be on the Scottish Education Council because of his very concerning views and they replied just with, you know, waffle, didn't begin to address the issue. So I did a sort of press release about it, sent it to all the newspapers. I mean, not expecting any of them to pick it up because basically they never do. But I realized today the Daily Express had run a story on it. I hadn't realized, but they had run a story. But it's very frustrating how they ran the story. They, they said, um, Dr. Colin Morrison, this is what he does. They quoted the bits from my letter my press release, say, you know, these are the quotations from his PhD dissertation. What do they do then? Uh, they invite someone from the Scottish Conservatives to comment on it. 
they phone up the Scottish Conservatives. So a big photograph of the Scottish Conservative MSP who says, uh, yeah, uh, but probably some parents and teachers will be concerned about this. So the Scottish Conservatives, they made no effort to find out about the issue. Um, once they were off the phone, once the MSP was off the telephone talking to the Daily Express, it will probably never cross her mind again. And we'll do nothing to follow it up, nothing to press the issue home at all. But the Daily Express gave the Conservatives the big picture centerpiece of the article. Then it gets to the very end of the article, and it just said that the letter was written by Richard Lucas of the Scottish Family Party. That's what we're up against in the media. The agenda of the Daily Express is to promote the Conservative Party. It's as simple as that. They want to promote the Conservative Party. They don't want to address any issues. They don't want to give a fair hearing to anyone else. Their agenda is to promote the Conservative Party. So if we raise an issue that would make people think, oh, that's good. Scottish Family Party picked up on that. Right, well done them. Uh, yeah, I'm on their wavelength. They don't want that to happen. So they'll take the issue. They'll present it in a way that puts the Conservatives front and centre. So even though they've done nothing about this issue and will do nothing about it, apart from just... But if the Daily Express phones up and says, would you like to criticise the SNP? Well, obviously, any Conservative is going to say, oh, yeah, uh, yeah, we will. Uh, yeah, we think that's wrong, whatever you're talking about. Yeah. And that's what happens. So that's what we're up against uh, in the media. So uh, say I didn't even know they'd run the story. But someone let me know today. But another thing I would... Uh, just mention, I'll come to a few comments in a minute. Keep the comments coming in. I'll uh, say, have a look in a minute. Uh, I've already banned Malcolm McKenzie. Um, so hopefully uh, he's not going to pop up uh, this week. But someone emailed after our little rally on uh, Saturday and said, oh, you know, the, the, uh, the rally, lots of talk about family, but I'm a single person. You know, how do I fit into the Scottish family party? I feel like I'm, you know, maybe excluded from it. I would sometimes hear that sort of comment from various directions. And the thing I would say to emphasize, the Scottish Family Party is not a party that's wanting to, to represent families, to have, it's not like a families union that argues to get a better deal for families. That's Because a lot of other political parties, they do take that sort of line. Like the Labour Party would say, you know, if, if, if you're a worker, you know, if, if you're a, you know, an employee, particularly working for the government, we're on your side. You know, we'll try and get you high wages or, or whatever. We don't say that. We're not saying we want these family friendly policies because we're on the side of families. And we, you know, it's in our self-interest. It's because we think that's what's best for society. So whether a person is single, married, divorced, retired, whatever. People can still look at our policies and think, yes, that is a recipe for a much healthier society. So that's what we're based about. So we're not saying we're a, a party for people in the families, well, everyone's connected to a family somewhere or another, or, or virtually everyone. We're not saying it's a party for that sort of person. It's a party with a, a policy platform, a lot of which is centered on strengthening family life because we think that's the, the missing ingredient in Scottish political debate, one of the missing ingredients in Scottish political debate. So hopefully uh, that answers the question. If you read our uh, policy booklet or our manifesto on the website, there's a paragraph very early on in the introduction that makes similar points. It says, you know, people's path through life takes them in all sorts of different directions. Some people, you know, uh, have their own family. Some people don't. Uh, sometimes it works out the way people want it. Sometimes it doesn't. Um, but what we're trying to do is to strengthen family life overall uh, in the nation because of the benefits that would bring. Right, so hopefully that's uh, that's answered that one. Right, uh, I'll talk about the results, and I've got one more little issue to mention, and then I will bring on our special guest. Right, so how did we do in the election? Well, very pleased. Uh, last year in the Scottish election on the list vote, where everyone in Scotland had the opportunity to vote for the Scottish Family Party, out of a choice of about was it twenty-one parties, and overall our vote was zero point five nine percent. Uh, this year, we had candidates in just under a quarter of the wards, in 84 wards. So that's, that's, that's quite a big sample we're taking there. And they average 1.34%. So more than twice as much. So the percentage more than doubled from last year. Now, maybe a fairer comparison for various reasons. I won't go into the details. Would be last year, we had seven constituency candidates. And 
Last year, every house should have got a leaflet. So those seven constituency candidates, the house had a leaflet and there were only maybe six parties on the ballot paper. It wasn't like the list where you've got 20 to choose from. There were just six. And in the council elections, there were usually just about six uh, parties to choose from. So in the constituencies last year, uh, they averaged 1%. And in the constituencies, uh, sorry, in the wards where we put a leaflet through pretty well every letterbox this time, we got 1.9%. So as best we can, that, that's a, a straight comparison. But there's lots of ifs and buts. So by both of those, it shows our vote sort of roughly doubling, roughly doubling uh, within a year, which is uh, good news. Uh, and if that carries on, if it keeps doubling every year, by the year 2030, we will have 512% of the vote. So that's uh, that's very encouraging. But, but even just, you know, adding on you know, roughly a percent a year, uh, Westminster election a couple of years, if we're on, so, you know, one and a half is now, Westminster election, you know, Two, two and a half, I don't know, two and a half, three and a half, who knows? Uh, Scottish election after them, three and a half, four, five. That puts you in with a chance of an MSP. So um, I, I've been saying I'm not one for, you know, every election coming out and saying, oh, this is it, this is going to be the breakthrough. We're going to get candidates elected this time. And then afterwards, you have to be, you know, you've got your tail between your legs saying, oh, well, you know, we'll, it'll be next time and, and whatever. Basically, you lose credibility. If you keep saying, oh, this is it, we're going to win some this time, you'll lose credibility. But I keep saying, you know, we're climbing a mountain and we've taken another step up it, a very significant step up it. Um, so that is uh, good. Our highest percentage in award was 3.5%. Uh, Hamish Goldie Scott down in is it, uh, mid Berwickshire, I think it's called. Uh, Hamish Goldie Scott, 3.5%. Our previous highest uh, result in a constituency or a region. Uh, it was 1.2%, uh, which is myself and Steve Saunders in the last election. We got 1.2% in our constituencies. So Hamish got uh, 3.5%. Uh, Phil Tanza got it was just a shade under 3%. Um, lots of candidates got over 2%, you know, well over 2%. So overall, uh, we're very pleased. Out of our 84 candidates, only one of them got a lower percentage than our average for the whole of Scotland last year. So only one out of 84 was below. 83 out of 84 were above our average uh, for last year. So whichever way you look at that, it, it, it's progress. It's a very significant improvement. But the numbers are still small, but that's where we are. And we keep moving upwards. But sometimes people think there's you know, a magic bullet to like accelerate pr uh, progress. If, if you just did this, if you just did that, have you thought about this? But yeah, there isn't a magic bullet. The other thing we found from our election results is that the wards where the candidates put a lot of work in did better. I mean, it makes a difference. Putting the effort in does better. I mean, the ward where I was in, I mean, I worked very hard. I put a leaflet through every letterbox. But the chap in the ward next door um, who uh, didn't campaign at all, uh, he, he said, you know, he wasn't going to campaign. He was never going to campaign. He just put his name down so people could vote for him. He actually got more votes and a higher percentage than me. And I did... 130 hours probably with a team of people helping uh delivering leaflets so it shows the area is very important it has a huge influence but overall we've been very pleased with the results and uh, onwards and upwards we'll now before too long we'll start thinking about the westminster election which will probably be in two years time i uh, will start uh, interviewing candidates allocating them to constituencies and sort of laying the groundwork for that campaign. Two years seems like a long time. It's, it's actually about the ideal time to be planning for an election because there's a lot you can do in the meantime. Three years, it seems a bit too distant, uh, but two years, I think, is um, a good time to be starting to think about it. Right, let's just... And to talk about women, to any form of Indian bread talking about women uh, myself oh a man gets to talk about women uh, yes indeed uh, well there's not talking about women actually talking about feminism uh, so slightly uh, different world war to some extent uh, possibly right do you ever talk about men uh, yes yeah we, we've talked about uh, men's issues um, I, I've got yeah well I'll wouldn't say more about that for now it's quite a, a big issue uh, Right. Uh, 
First time SFP voter. Right, thank you very much, uh, Carol. Uh, one of the many. And yeah, hope you can vote for us in the future as well. And okay, right, let's say welcome to our guest. Mike, thanks for coming to join us again. Hello, Richard. It's a great pleasure. Enjoyed last time, and I'm sure I'll enjoy this evening. Yes, uh -huh. yeah, there lots of people enjoyed watching last time. I got quite a lot of uh, a lot of views uh, after it, uh, so that was good. Now, Mike and I just had a, a quick chat before we went live, and Mike mentioned an issue that I'd noticed as well today. You've probably heard me say before, I listen to Radio 4 sometimes in the car. I'll just turn it on randomly, hear what's happening, and I sort of count how many seconds it is before it gets on to racism, sexism, LGBT, colonial, colonialism, climate change. You know, what one of the uh, sort of pet issues? And the answer is, I'm not exaggerating, uh, exaggerating. It's normally about three seconds. doesn't matter what the program's about. So today I tuned in and the program was about uh, maps, history of maps. So no doubt, you know what they're saying, you know, this is... Uh, um, it's a Western centric uh, people from the Southern Hemisphere feel excluded by it. They want to redraw because it's all influenced by colonialism. We'll now go, now go to someone from the decolonizational institute or something or other. It just it doesn't matter what the topic is. That's what it ends up with. That's um, my you you were saying you just find the uh, this, is it Radio Four you listen to and find the same thing? No, I, I, I used to, but honestly, it's um, I find it's it's it, it's. Uh... Gosh, it, inst it creates mental health issues for me. Radio Four. It is seconds. You're quite right. You, you can um, you can be listening to anything. Gardener's Question Time. There'll be something in there. Um, it's 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 truly appalling. But no, I, I listen to BBC Radio Three quite a bit, classical music, and the transatlantic slave trade. They managed to shoehorn that in every damn day. Uh -huh. um, yeah. It's 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 appalling. So I will recommend to people a book I'm reading at the moment. Um, uh, Douglas Murray's "The War on the West" absolutely outstanding as always with uh, with with Douglas Murray. Yeah, yeah. But I think if people are listening to that BBC output uncritically, they'll just take on that, that these are the pressing issues in the world. Mm. You you will very rarely hear anything about like people who are short of food or haven't got the medical care that they need. You know, they're blind for lack of a a fairly cheap uh, operation. All, all sorts of these issues. Not interested. Not interested because it doesn't tick one of their boxes. The other thing I find there's yeah. endless stories about people who are ill or disabled. Now, as far as I'm concerned, you know, hearing about people's experience of being ill, okay, that's fine. That's part of life. Uh, people who are disabled, overcoming obstacles, achieving things. Okay, you know, again, that's, that's part of life. I'm quite happy to hear about it. But it's just, just so, so much of it. If you say, you know, mountaineering, if there's a story on mountaineering, it seems like it's more likely to be about, you know, the one-legged mountaineer than it is about someone who's, you know, broken a record. It's just, there's just so much of it. Have you noticed that? So why is that there? What's, what's the agenda there? I think? Uh, sorry, Richard. Um, I think it's a question of, I mean, in, on every issue, the BBC... Has a, has um a, you know it divides everything into into two sides, and it will only cover one side. So, for example, on climate change, you'll never hear anything about all 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 the evidence which suggests that the one you know the, the CO two theory of global warming kind of doesn't make much sense when you really look at it. But but they'll they'll never they'll, they'll never talk about that. We, we 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 interviewed a guy for our last conference, Robin Atkins, uh, Robin Aitken. I'm sorry, mm -hmm. who used to work on the Today program. And he was talking about a seminar many, many years ago, which the BBC, I think it was Greenpeace or, or, or Friends of the Earth or somebody, were, were hosted this conference at, at the BBC um, at the BBC headquarters. And somebody senior in the BBC said, well, the, the, the science is very clearly settled. We shall henceforth not give any airspace to uh, uh, airtime to anybody who is critical of that consensus. Well, you don't have to do too much research to realize there is not a great consensus. Uh, um, but um, it's, it's true of everything. It's true of, um, I mean, uh, um, you know, feminism, feminism runs through everything. You know, me, me, you know, uh, men's, men's rights, men's rights just never get gets gets mentioned. 
female genital mutilation all the time, male genital mutilation never. Al oh. Although although the first is, you know, has specific legislation and has you know huge resources um, uh, devoted to ending it, and it is pretty well ended in the UK. Um, whereas male genital mutilation is completely ignored. Yeah, I mean, male know. male circumcision is, is a topic I haven't finished thinking my way through yet, so I'm not going to respond to that. We'll maybe talk about that uh, another day. I've read a couple okay. of papers on it. It's, it's quite interesting. Um, you're talking about there the, the failures get, to get the balance. I, I think that's, um, that's certainly true. And in politics too, so when it comes to, to feminism, I mean, it's true. I mean, you, you could watch politics. You could watch the BBC. You could probably sit in classrooms in Scotland. You could go to lectures uh, around the UK uh, for years on end, and you would come to the conclusion that just everyone, or at least all women, but virtually everyone, uh, is a feminist, has completely signed up to feminist principles. But what, what's the reality? Well, the reality, um, there was a survey conducted by the Fawcett Society, a radical feminist um, charity, going back to the middle mid-19th century. Uh, that they, they conducted um, a survey in 2015, published in 2016, in a thing called the State of the Nation, I think, and I'm astonished to this day that they published this finding. <coughs> the, the, the survey by a reputable company found that only 9% of British women and 4% of British men identify as feminists. So one in 11 women, one in 25 men. From all this, the geniuses at the Forces Society concluded that the, 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 the country was a country of hidden feminists. Uh -huh. You couldn't make this stuff up, Richard. You really couldn't. Yeah. It's, I it's, saw it's, some stats once. I think I saw a 27% of women. I mean, there's probably different ways of asking the question, but whichever way you ask it, it seems there's clearly a minority. And yet the, the main political parties, they operate on the assumption that the way to appeal to female voters is by taking the feminist line. Well, this is the interesting thing, Richard. It's strange, because, isn't it? This is the interesting thing because all the parties chase the female vote. Mm -hmm. None of them none of them chased the male vote. It's really quite extraordinary. They're all fishing in the same pond and there's an equally big pond and it doesn't occur to them that, uh, you know, maybe that it'd be easier to get to get votes there. And there is, of course, only one uh, politician in the English speaking world, elected politician, who ever talks on men's issues. And that's Philip Davis MP, who's spoken at three of our conferences. Um, we actually had, we, we, we actually had um, three more Tory MPs lined up to speak at our last conference. All three of them pulled out without explanation. Mm -hmm. Just going back to the, uh, the sort of democratic issue, you say all the parties try and court uh, women's votes. I think that's definitely true. But they do it by taking a feminist line. Mm. But it, I mean, uh, 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 does that actually appeal to women? If only 9% or whatever, 20% whatever, refer to themselves as women, are, are they actually being successful? in courting the female vote, or are they missing the mark? But you would assume that they're, they're quite sophisticated in their focus groups and polling or whatever. Would you think they're, they're missing the mark there? Or it's, it's, are they appealing yeah, to women? It's a very good question, Richard. We, we, we have, um, I was very struck by, um, by, by your, you know, your last conference speech. Uh, and, um, uh, and, and it's in fact, it's informed, I mean, along with other things that your party's done, it's informed our manifesto and much else. The position that we take on abortion, for example, it's it's, it's our view that um, the, the, the choice is not between the current 24 weeks uh, for elective abortion and stopping it. Um, it's between 24 weeks and perhaps 13 weeks. And there is some support in Parliament for that. So that's the position we've taken. But it's a step on a longer journey as far mm -hmm. as we're concerned. And I, I was always struck at uh, conferences uh, particularly the conservative conferences, when we were campaigning on issues like domestic violence and abortion and so on, nine out of 10 of the people who'd come up to me, if I had a pro-life placard and leaflets, nine out of 10 of them would would, would, uh, would be women. Mm -hmm. the, the men kind of like shuffled along, you know, a little bit embarrassed. But the women, you know, they, they would say, yes, we, um, um, we, we're with you on abortion. We're with you on domestic violence. We, we know as many men uh, suffer uh, domestic violence as as women. Um, but no, I, I think I think I think the parties are are, are hopelessly out of touch. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, for, I mean, for example, the the appeal to to mothers from all the parties, elected parties, is always 
we'll look after your children for even longer than is available at the moment. Um, where, where the evidence shows that that basic business for the majority of mums would prefer to be able to be with their own kids for longer and have to work less when they're, when they're working part-time, whatever. They, they would prefer to shift the balance and the direction of more time with the kids. Um, but all the parties assume that they're thinking the exact opposite. Indeed. Well, we, we have things in our manifesto, for example, um, the personal personal tax allowance, uh, to make that up to 100% transferable in the case of families with four kids and stepped you know, from 10% uh, 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 below that. And a doubling of a doubling of child benefit. Mm -hmm. Well, we've we've got a fully transferable tax allowance uh, for for married couples. Full stop. That's our. Oh, that's okay. our, when it can be afforded. We're not saying you know we just you know you do that instantly regardless of the of the cost. It would obviously have to be uh, done in a measured way. But that's what we would uh, what we would prefer. I mean, so do you think? I think a lot of female voters there. So, so if a woman's thinking, I would actually prefer. To be with the kids a bit longer. I don't really want to be working as much as I am. Mm. Because no politician ever addresses that issue. Do, do they maybe not think about that as being a valid political issue? So well, I, I, if I was on TV every night saying, you know, this is what we'd like to offer. We'd like to give uh, parents, mums, dads, you know, mums in particular, we'd like to give more choice. Um, currently, there's lots of support, childcare for mums to work more. We'd want to... Uh, have systems in place that enable mums to make the decision to be at home with the kids as well, to try and make that easier for them. I mean, would that result in a huge swell of support when they sort of well, wake I, up to the fact that there, it is possible to, right. to receive help for that? Well, we, we, we've we've uh, been very upfront, Richard, about our, our, um, our, our, our political strategy is basically the UKIP and Brexit party strategy. To bounce the to bounce the uh, the major parties, by which pr probably the, the the Conservatives, I mean, you know, UKIP had virtually no MPs elected, but changed the course of British history. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, uh, um, Nigel Farage, I have no, I, I believe he's not the most popular man in Scotland, um, but but he's he's a political hero to me, as was Mrs. Thatcher, who again may not be the most popular woman in in Scotland. I I, I recognise. But, uh, you know, at the end of the day, I mean, if you take the Bedford constituency where I'm where I'm standing next time, um, anybody, man or woman, who wants to reduce the um, maximum term for elective abortions has only one party to vote for. All the major parties um, are, are not going to move on 24 weeks. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's only one seat, but, you know, um, you know, uh, you know, from small acorns and all that. Yeah. I would say with the pro-life issue, if you take the Scottish Conservatives, for example, even if they wanted to make it their policy. I mean, but they don't. I mean, there's, I mean, how many Scottish Conservative MSPs are there who are pro-life? I mean, maybe uh, maybe two or three. How many of them have I heard make a pro-life statement? Zero. Absolutely zero. I have never heard a Scottish Conservative MSP make the slightest noise in a pro-life direction. But even if they did want to, it wouldn't make sense for them electorally. Because you're talking about uh, ten or fifteen percent of the population who are, you know, sort of fairly clear pro-life. So for the Scottish Conservatives, who are trying to get forty percent of the vote, then it makes no sense to make that as a policy. It just makes no sense. Right. Uh, whereas for us, it makes perfect sense. No, indeed. But uh, I think there are other other issues, Richard. And here I would uh, very much um, l like to talk just for a little bit about our number one area of concern, which is um, parents being, well, children being denied access to a parent following mm -hmm. family breakdowns. I think that's, a, that's um, well, it's child abuse. It's also abuse of the, the non-resident parent, 90% of the time the father, but also um, grandparents, great-grandparents, aunts and uncles, cousins. It's a long list of people, and a lot of mm -hmm. those people have votes. Mm -hmm. So so again, in Bedford, you know, I mean, if you if you want to guarantee... Um, but you know that, that children sees both parents after family breakdowns. There's one party to vote for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're saying earlier on about uh, feminism not being an equality movement, or, or never having been, or, or isn't anymore. What, what do you mean by that? In what way is okay. it not an equality movement? Could they claim okay. to be? Right, it certainly claims to be. And 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 sometimes I get hit over the head by a. Feminist with the dictionary definition, which is the pursuit of gender equality, it's just it's hilarious. 
Um, certainly, if you go back to, I don't know, 1851, 1852, the Seneca Falls Convention in New York, um, which, which for a lot of us, you know, we, we would see that as the birth of modern feminism. Um, it, was, it was not about uh, uh, equality in any sense. It was about extending female privilege. And fe feminism, I mean, there, there have been one or two areas for, for, for a short period of time. But, but feminism, it's, it's, you know, it's DNA, if you like, is to increase women's privileges. And I'm always so, amused. So just go back to when was this conference again? Did you say 18? Uh, um, 1851 or 1852. I mean, surely in those days that they were fighting for equality under the law, uh, to go to school, to go to university, to own property within a marriage. Um, I mean, were they the central issues? Surely they're genuine equality issues, aren't they? Um, there, there, there are so many. Well, I mean, for, for example, I mean, um, um, if we look at it in the um, Victor, much of the Victorian era in the UK, I'm not, I'm not terribly familiar with the estates, but but in in, in the in the UK, mm -hmm. um, if 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 a woman incurred a debt in the Victorian era that she couldn't settle, um, the husband went to debtors' prison. Um, so so basically, you know. Um, Feminists are forever misrepresenting male responsibility for male power. And if anybody want, wants to wants to read a cracking book about uh, feminism, um, the first one I think I'd recommend to people was written in 1913. Uh, it's called The Fraud of Feminism by Ernest Belford Bax, a socialist philosopher and, and journalist. And he absolutely nailed it. He was writing about the fraud of feminism in the late 1880s. So if you go back to like financial arrangements within marriage. So you're saying what's interpreted as, for example, uh, women not being able to uh, own property. I don't know to what extent legally the finances were combined. I mean, did that not leave uh, women at a disadvantage in the case of marital breakdown or? No, no. I mean, um, overall, you think it was a fair deal then? Well, I mean, the, the point is that, that, you know, the man was responsible for the joint finances. Um, so, you know, but that, but that's, you know, it's, 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 it's a different era, Richard, to put it mild, uh -huh. isn't it? Uh, um, how about, uh, how about uh, education but, then? But whenever, you know, whenever a feminist tells me she wants equality, I thank her and say, which of your privileges are you happy to, to, to give up? So if you just um, say in 1843, though, I mean, ed education, I mean, there, there weren't equal educational opportunities. So that would have been part of what the feminists were asking for then. But so that was a genuine equality issue, wasn't it? Yeah, I'm not saying there weren't any, Richard, but but you know we 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 could spend the next half hour talking about the 19th century, and uh, as I suggest there's a lot there's a lot more in the 21st and 20th century yeah, that. But, but I, I was saying that because you did say that right from the beginning it wasn't about equality. No, no, but but but, but, but I would say that there were some okay, equality issues. All right, all right, it would take me an hour to really sort of go to go into that in detail, and and uh, none of us have the patience for that, Richard. Um, uh -huh. But 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 if you take, I mean, you know, something that, that um, you know, we, we we have in our manifesto twenty one areas, twenty one issues that we have, um, and I think in sixteen of them, women are privileged, which leads to the disadvantaging of 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 men or you know females and males anyway, if we put it that way. Um, that, you know, I'm not aware of a single area where in 2022, where are we? 2022. That's right. Mm -hmm. um, in in Britain. Um, um, women's rights specifically, or female rights specifically, are assaulted. I, I'm aware of 16 or 17 areas where the human rights of, of men and boys are assaulted. And I'd say almost always to privilege women and girls. But, but, okay, but could you give, me, give us a couple of examples of those? Well, a very, a very obvious one, Richard, and I know I've touched on it, and, and perhaps we'll touch on another day, is genital mutilation or circumcision. Yeah, but I, I'm, yeah, I don't want to talk about that. I haven't quite. Uh, prepared myself to talk on okay, that. Okay, fair enough. I miss when I... Okay, okay, but you know, it, male circumcision has been illegal since 1861, but it goes on all the time. Um, okay, well, um, you know, in the, in the case of um, in the case of, of education, the um, in 1980, the the in the 1987-88 uh, academic year, uh, certainly in England, but I think across the UK, I, I, I stand to be corrected possibly. Um, O levels were replaced by GCSEs, mm -hmm. um, and prior to that, contrary to popular opinion, um, boys and girls were doing actually um, very similar within one or two percent year on year, slight variation year on year. 
And the entire point of, of moving to um, to, to uh, GCSEs was, was to allow both male and female teachers' pro-girl bias to reflect in grades. And if you look at, if, 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 you, if you check out uh, William Collins's book, The Empathy Gap, which is available, available by the way, in ebook format for under five pounds, an absolute steal. He shows that the gender, um, that the, the education gender gap appeared that year, and it's been with us ever since. So, what was different about the exams that brought that about? Do you think? Well, it wasn't the exams, Richard. It was the fact that that a substantial proportion of the grades were down to teachers' assessment. So, so they were subjective, and it was known even at that point that both male and female teachers. Um, uh, you know, had, had a bias towards towards giving girls higher grades, and so 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 they knew in doing this that 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 uh, girls would do better than boys. It was really quite as simple as that. I mean, it's also I think quite well known that girls basically tend to do better on coursework as well. They'd be a bit more conscientious putting the effort in on the coursework throughout uh, the two years. I suppose the counter argument to that could be well. Is that not still a fair part of the assessment? Who's to say that just doing it on the exam is the fairer one? And maybe the fair result is that the girls do actually do better, and including the coursework is um, is just a reflection of that. Now, of course, that that argument would never be accepted the other way around. But could there be a case for that? I don't think so, Richard. I mean, previously to that, to say it was it was virtually nip and tuck, you know, exactly the same. But but there's 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 you know, you know, there's. I, I can touch on plenty more areas. Yeah, just to say, on, say on the exams, I'll tell you another factor. I believe would be a factor there. Basically, when GCSEs came along, it got easier. O levels ah, were tougher. Yes. Um. So O levels used to be grading people at the, you know, the upper end of the IQ distribution. Let's put it put it like that. And generally, virtually anything you can measure uh, about men and women, men tend to be more varied in it so they tend to be more at the extremes more at the extreme low end more at the extreme high end so if you're measuring at a part of the distribution where you're you're to the point where there's going to be more uh towards the extremes so there's going to be more you know you're looking at like very high iq for an a grade at o level or you know relatively high iq that there's likely that you're going to get more or, or more boys will be doing well there i mean similarly if, if you introduce a qualification that's really, really easy, and almost everyone can pass, then more boys will fail it than girls. If you introduce a qualification that's really difficult, and only a few will pass, then probably more boys are going to pass it Absolutely. than girls. That's yeah. So that yes. might be a part of the factor as well. Yes, because of the, the IQ bell curves, uh, absolutely right. Mm -hmm. But, but um, um, in, in our party's launch video, I included uh, some, 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 some uh, information from a channel called History Debunked, and this, this, this uh, the historian who runs that compared maths questions um, for 11 year olds in the 11 plus in 1970, which was just before uh, calculators, and and um, in, and maths questions in a 2016, I think it was O level, so 16 year. So you're basically comparing 11 year olds in 1970 with 16 year olds in 2016, and the the questions were stratospherically more difficult back in 1970 with no calculator no. than in 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 than in um than, than than in 2016 what one of the questions i remember was um write down in numbers um the four so that was just written out in english you know 3000 8034 mm -hmm. one was uh and the o level was what is a quarter of 16 I love mm -hmm. the idea of a 16 year old using a calculator for that but but who you know, the the dumbing down in the education system in the last 50 years is a national scandal yeah absolute scandal uh, yeah I mean people talk about the uh, inverse Flynn effect the Flynn effect uh, was a measured increase in over in average IQ over a number of decades it was monitored quite closely but some people now are talking about the inverse Flynn effect they basically think average IQ is declining and i think if you look back at, at say victorian and earlier you know georgian times look at the way people wrote I mean, it's incredible it's incredible i mean like the, the orders wellington wrote on the back of his horse in the middle of the battle of waterloo there's not many people who can write english so elegantly and precisely 
under any circumstances. Now, so, so I think there's, uh, there's yeah, possibly a case. I, I'd also like to talk about, about, I mean, grade inflation mm -hmm. is an, uh, it's part of the educational scandal. So you yeah. have in particular, I think, you know, um, I mean, 60 percent of university students today are, are, are female and they, 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 uh, they get such grades. The number of students who get first today compared to when I did my degree 40 years ago is I think it's like three times as many. Mm -hmm. So all, you, all the, all, sorry. Um, it, whatever's going on in England, you should hear. I'll just tell you what's going on in Scotland. <laughs> uh, in Scotland, they're obsessed with the attainment gap. They want pupils in wealthy areas to get the same results as pupils in less wealthy areas. So they basically de define the, the science of heredity and IQ, basically. that They're going to sort of overcome that by throwing money at schools. And, and they've been throwing money at it for years and getting basically absolutely nowhere. They can't close this gap, obviously. Uh, but then along came the lockdown. And instead of doing exams, they, they did coursework and teacher assessment. And the grade inflation at the schools in poorer areas was just absolutely outrageous, completely ridiculous. So the Scottish Qualifications Agency said, well, this is this is just a bit crazy. We're just going to tone it down a little bit. We're not going to take them right down to what they should be statistically, but we're just going to you know, tone it down a little bit to make it a bit more realistic. Uh, but then you get kids in the street waving placards saying they've been discriminated against. So the government capitulates, tells the Scottish Qualifications Authority, OK, whatever the teacher said, that's their grade. And of course, lo and behold, the attainment gap has been closed. Huge progress closing the attainment gap. So Absolutely. now the Scottish educational establishment in general is saying we've cracked it. This is what we need to do to close the attainment gap. Just have the teachers uh, you know, mark, marking the work. I, I say making up the grades. Maybe that, that's a bit uh, a bit flippant. Uh, but sort of internal assessment. And they're even saying now, they're even saying that if you have the same assessment process carried out in the school, then even that's discriminatory. If you say these are the these are the criteria you need to mark it by, and it's got to be the same in every school, they're saying no, that's discriminatory, because it's not tuned to the special needs of the poorest pupils. It's only Indeed. the teachers who know them who I'm, can really assess their progress. I wonder if we could go uh, to another area, Richard, um, mm -hmm. of, of female privilege, which is um, which is sentencing, the criminal justice system. Uh -huh. um, m men are are sentenced far more harshly. Than, than, than women. And again, William Collins is The Empathy Gap is the book to go for here. But he shows basically that if, um, th th that if men were sentenced as leniently as women, a sizable majority of, of men in British prisons would not be there. And in fact, we, uh, we could probably close three quarters of the prisons um, in the UK uh, on that basis. So, I mean, so, so I say to a feminist, well, if you want gender, you know, if you're after gender equality, do you want um, women to be sentenced as uh, harshly as men, I've yet to have a feminist say she wants that kind of equality because that's totally the wrong wrong sort of equality, of course. Mm -hmm. So why does that happen? I mean, that's not written into the law, I assume. That's just well, judges. Yes, yes, and no. I mean, there's there's plenty of guidance in the in, 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 there's plenty of guidance to 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 judges. I, I mean, just 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 to finish my previous point. Um, that that I mean, I think there are about eighty five thousand men in British prisons, five thousand women. They're closing the women's prisons and building another 20,000 places, which will all go to men. Why, why does it happen? Gynocentrism. Uh, society is concerned um, about um, privileging women, um, holding men to account, not holding women to account. Now, in, in Scotland, there's a deliberate policy to to avoid women going to prison and, and to basically eliminate women's prisons. I mean, is that the across, same in England? Is that the same? Across the UK. Yes, absolutely, sort of... across the UK. And, of course, then there's the um, women's trump card of being a mother well as far as i'm concerned if a woman commits a, a crime that um if she were not a mother or if she were a man would would get a prison sentence she should she should go to prison i mean w women women you know we get plenty of female criminals serial female criminals who know that they will not be sentenced to to a prison sentence yeah it's, it's, i would say that that's a tricky one if, if i was a judge i maybe that would be a factor in my thinking I don't mean you know, I wouldn't send a woman to prison if she just like murdered six other people in her family or something. But in a borderline case, that might be a factor. That yeah, I, I, I I'm not talking. I'm not, talk, I'm not talking about borderline cases, Richard. I'm talking about mm -hmm. cases where where a man would go in into prison for years, 
Um, and at the end of the day, should we not? Um, it's all about accountability. Should we not expect a mother of, of, of a child, perhaps a very young child, to not commit serious crimes? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, I but the, the, always, the deterrent effect always, would there, be there, stronger. There, there, there's always a female card to be played. That, that, that we just will not hold women accountable in the way that we hold men accountable. So the statistics on this, where do they come from? Are they like from official? Are they acknowledged by the in the legal system that that's the case? What that men are um, sentenced, sentenced far more, more harshly. harshly. Yeah. Oh, well, there's no question. I mean, uh, just read William Collins. I mean, it's it's you know it's uh, yeah. the it's the sort of are the statistics from within the legal system though, or is this an, an oh, yes. outside observer? Uh, Absolutely. Oh, from, oh, oh, oh. No, no, what from, do they say from, about them? From the Department of Justice. Well, I, I know for a fact, Richard, um, from um, a Conservative MP that I know, he had a discussion with, um, with, with, with the Justice Secretary, and he said, he said to the Justice Secretary, "Surely it's not fair in this day and age that that women are sentenced so much more lightly than men." And this Conservative um, Justice Secretary said, "Well, of course they are, and I'm completely in support of that." What is yeah. it? What has this got to do with? You know, gender equality. You know, um, feminists don't want gender equality. They, 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 you know, I've never heard of a feminist campaigning for that. They'll, they'll campaign for women in the boardroom, never, never for women in the sewers. Uh, so, actually, just going back to the uh, punishments, sentences. I mean, in Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon announced a pardon to women who'd been punished as witches yes. hundreds of years ago. Yeah, well, completely pointless, waste of time. Yeah, but she's just trying to again. It's, it's a feminist. Uh, card to play but you look at that i mean if she thinks that women were on the receiving end of uh, unfair punishments there particularly women that's why she got involved in it but currently it, it looks like uh, the balance is the other way I don't, I don't know i'm not I'm not saying which side's been treated unfairly i would suspect it's probably uh, women in my view it would be that uh, some women criminals have been treated too leniently but it's fascinating isn't it that uh, a discrepancy like that can can just go virtually uncommented on in a society. Well, but would anyone re really like to come out and de would a politician like to come out and defend that publicly? I mean, do you think they would? I mean, if, if say Boris Johnson or Nicola Sturgeon or Keir Starmer, whoever, if they were put on the spot and asked, do you think it's right that women generally get uh, less harsh sentences for identical crimes? What do you think they'd say? It's a very good question, Richard. I um. I don't know, but the media will never put those. You know, the media is part no. of the problem. I mean, as you were saying right at the beginning, absolutely right. The mainstream media are, are as corrupted by feminism as as anybody else. You know, any, any uh, I mean, well, I mean, I, I could talk for an hour on that on that subject alone. But we've um, had another one for the questions. I, I went to scroll through and find it. Someone asked about the uh, the gender pay gap. Oh God! Um, again, Co Collins, Co Collins destroys this. Um, the gender pay gap, you know, is 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 very small, but but it exists because uh, men and women go into different um, t t tend to go into different lines of work. Uh, men men w w women tend to go into lines of work to do with people and animals. Interestingly enough, M most vets, most uh, vet, vet veterinary science graduates are women and have, have and have been for many years. Whereas men go to things like engineering. Women also go into lines of work where they can practice uh, locally, f f uh, combine it with a family. Uh, whereas an engineer might have to be away for six months, you know, whatever, you know, perhaps overseas. So you know, it it's always it's always said that we need more female engineers. And for the life of me, I don't know why we do. Um, women don't want to go into the profession. When I last looked at, at this in 2015, 30 million pounds had been spent trying to persuade more women into engineering with very little effect. But the, the gender imbalance at universities is higher in the case of psychology. Over 90% of psychology students are women. And hey, guess what, Richard? That's not a problem that, you know, we, we don't need more male psychologists, apparently. Yeah. Mm -hmm. or, or teachers. I mean, the, the, the decline or, in the number or, or, or of doctors. Male teachers. Or, or, or doctors. doctors. In the 1970s, Dr. Vernon Coleman, the first TB doctor, was, was reporting that medical schools were preferencing women um, for, for, uh, for, for courses. And he said this will lead to, to disaster because women will not um, d d do do evening work. They won't do weekend work. They'll want to work part time, whether or not they have children. And we see we see the GP service um, an absolute national scandal. And the reason is that most most GPs for, for for some time now have been women, and they work part time, whether or not they have children. 
And that's why it can take you two or three weeks to see a GP. Whereas when I was a young man, you, you know, you could see a GP the same day or the next day. But that's a knotty problem. That I know in Pakistan that they just had an open admissions policy to their medical schools. And through that policy, they ended up um, a substantial majority uh, were women studying to be doctors in Pakistan. And they found in Pakistan that over their careers, the women worked a, a lot less years uh, than the men did. And they eventually said, we can't afford this. Ah. You know, we're not a rich country. We can't afford to be training that, like, almost twice as many doctors as we need because they're only going to work for half of the time through their careers. So they actually put a cap on it. I don't know if they capped it on I think maybe at 50-50, just to try and solve the problem. Now, in yeah. Britain, I find that's, that that's a really knotty problem to solve because, I mean, does anyone really want to say, you know, have quotas for male and female? I mean, that's that would be quite unfair on individuals. So well, I, we, I don't know the yeah. answer to that. But um, well, I, mean, I, well, I guess what one, actually one answer could be um, requiring more um, sort of upfront commitment to it. So like you, you take on a loan to do the course and it, there's quite a lot to pay back, a substantial amount to pay back. And then if, if doctor's salaries reflect that amount and you have to pay back, then that would mean, an, so, so the risk of the investment would be more on the individual rather than on the state to, to spend all the money training a doctor than only getting half a doctor uh, from it. Maybe that would be a fair way, but I say it's, it's a it's a tricky one. But. I don't think it's remotely tricky, Richard, to be honest with you. I mean, I think the reality is, is I think they got it right in Pakistan on this one. Um, the, the, the figures are similar in the UK. You you basically have to train two women to get the same lifetime work as as one man. Um, mm -hmm. And so, so you know, if, if, if there's any group, and, and the problem is, of course, that, 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 that this this feminization of the medical profession meant meant a, meant a huge slump in capacity. So, 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 how was that solved? It was solved by bringing in huge number of doctors from the third world, uh, where, where 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 they really couldn't afford to lose them. It's scandalous. Rather than say, you know, seventy percent of medical students being women is a problem. It is leading to lots of, and, and you know, and you look at, you go to any hospital, Richard, and 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 you know, look, look at the number of of male doctors, and and I might say, and I'm not making a racist point here, the number of white male doctors. I mean, in my, in my local Bedford practice, um, that there are ten doctors, one of them is a white man. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. It's a it's a social engineering exercise, the NHS. Mm hmm. Yeah, that, that's an interesting one anyway. But, um, but going back to subject choices, I mean, I've looked into that a bit in Scotland. Mm -hmm. In Education Scotland, our national education agency, as far as I can tell, there are six members of staff whose mission it is to persuade more girls to do physics and maths. Right. And the sum total of their efforts uh, is zero because it, it's just flatlining. But what, what happened, I mean, there was a time when basically uh, girls weren't allowed to do those subjects. But then the uh, the gates were open; they could do them, uh, or yeah, the stigma was taken off or whatever. And the proportion increased through the 1970s. But I think it was by the time we got into the 80s, it reached an equilibrium and it's flatlined ever since. Because it seems like boys and girls are just choosing to do what they want to do, and no matter what efforts are made, it makes no difference at all. But they will never admit that, though. They could never admit that. Okay, yeah. that this is just natural. This is what people want to do. We're perfectly happy with that. I mean, they're never, never happy with it. They're just going to keep going. I always want to say, you know, if you've done a gender studies degree and you're working for a government-funded sock puppet charity, you know, why, why didn't you become the engineer? Why didn't you right. go and study physics? Well, I didn't like it. Well, that's not good enough. We need more women in. People like you need to get and you know, get and sign on and study physics. Well, I'm not very good at the, it. I don't. The, I, the the Conservative Party. I just put up a blog post um, uh, recommending that voters in Bedford don't vote for the Conservative candidate because the Conservative Party has just announced, or the chairman announced, that they have um, a goal of gender parity among Conservative MPs. Now, mm -hmm. um, I worked for the party from 2007 to eight, and at the time, the ratio of men to women in applying to be prospective parliamentary candidates was ten to one, and I'd be amazed if it had changed since. So basically, they're mm -hmm. saying that, that 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 they should be passing over ten men um, in favour of one woman. Now, mm -hmm. what are the chances that the best person out of those eleven people is the woman? Mm -hmm. Not high, is it? So, so, no. um, and, and this is the Conservative Party. They are basically taking on all the policies that Harriet Harman yeah. 
yeah. um, and, and, and others of her type um, have been advocating. That they've, they've waved the white flag at feminism. Yeah. But it's the same in the Scottish Parliament. I think all the parties, if they haven't got strict gender quotas, but they work pretty hard. And I think it is reflected in the in the quality of the MSPs. I'm not going to like point to individuals, but overall, it was reflected in Scotland. <coughs> Jess Phillips. There, there, was, there was talk of um, introducing a law that forced parties to put forward 50% male, 50% female candidates in elections, which I think would be a sort of anti-democratic outrage. Because for us, that would be a massive problem. I mean, generally, men are more interested in politics than women. Men, are, uh, in general, more of them are, want to go into you know, public life. Uh, in general, men tend to be more conservative in their views than women. So for the Scottish Family Party, you know, that, that's three factors that mean generally we're likely to have more male than female candidates. I mean, as, as it happens, our proportion of male female candidates is about the same as like the Labour Party. Uh, and it's better, that, well, I say better, that there's more female candidates than the Conservatives. So we actually outdo or equal some of the parties who are making all sorts of special efforts to bring women on board. It, it, it just happens naturally. Uh, well, the, the, so I was going to say the, 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 the Labour Party, now more than 50% of its MPs in Westminster are women. Mm -hmm. So logically then, well, if, if, if we're after equality, yay, um, they should now be introducing all male shortlists. Uh -huh. And this will surprise you, Richard, but they're not. No, so fifty no, percent is basically is basically a flaw. It was never a target. It was a flaw, and it mm -hmm. also. But, but the the ceiling now is on men. Men cannot be more than fifty percent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And, and so, in areas so, in areas where naturally uh, there's going to be more men uh, drawn to it, then it, it's just a discrimination uh, against men. When people hear about the gender pay gap, I mean, I hope a lot of men are realizing that that basically in terms of pay they're likely to be being discriminated against. I was talking to someone the other week. They were saying within their company, there's pay is, done, pay is done individually. There's no like general agreement, it's done individually. And all the men were feeling, mm, you know, I thought I'd done pretty well. My review was really good. But that's quite a low increase. And they're thinking basically that the company's just got its eye on its gender pay gap. Um, and, and you hear people say as well, you know, in the company, if, if a young woman comes in, they just want to promote her as quickly as possible because they want women in senior positions. Because that's that, that's the company policy. And I can tell you, Richard, um, I, I hear every week from men who say that some, some a female colleague has been promoted above them and um, people are just absolutely staggered. And these women often have to lean on the person that they've just been promoted over to enable them to do their job. Yeah. Now, the danger with this, of course, is once you're into this, when I mean, everyone's going to have disappointments in their career, so, so the temptation is for every man who doesn't get promoted and a woman does to think, oh, you know, it's by a sort of... But the big picture, it, it just is inevitable. As soon as a company starts thinking, well, well they, they are. They're vulnerable to government regulation and government reporting that's going to, at the very least, embarrass them. Or they might end up with a legal case against them for their gender pay gap. So they're scared. They think, we've got to make sure we're getting women promoted. And, and men need to, to wake up and realise that Subtly, they're probably being discriminated against one way or another. In the I think, I think, I think what you, I'm going to have to go very shortly, Richard. But I think yes, what you're saying, I think what you're saying is, and, and I would agree with you, that men need to strap on a pair. Uh, well, maybe I wouldn't put it like that, but I, I think it's, it's unaware, unaware. They're not putting two and two together because the whole culture. I think adults are indoctrinated in Britain. So all the people working for a company, they're all getting the message that you know, women are oppressed. That they, they need special promotion, we've got to change, uh, close the gender pay gap. These are really important targets. I think a lot of men just sit there thinking, uh, well, you know, I'm not really that interested, but yeah, okay, fair enough. Uh, you know, I, I don't know. So they're not really realizing what's happening. But you said you need to go away uh, shop at 10. I've very much enjoyed that chat. We didn't disagree with much after all. Did no, we? we didn't. We were, thank, thank you. Uh, enjoyed we were, it as always. Uh, yeah, great. So we will see you again. Look, no look forward to that. Uh, viewers, don't go away. I'll have a look at some of the comments before we finish. But I will say good night to Mike. Thanks, uh, Richard. Thanks very much for coming on. Good night. Thanks. Right, I'll just have a quick look at a few comments and then we'll uh, we'll wind up. Um, right, what's this? Uh, money or debt is a feminine thing. Spider's web. 
Right, I'm not quite sure about that one. Let's uh, cross the living crisis, never mind the gender pig. Now, uh, yeah, I would say about that. The thing is, all these things, gender pig up, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, there's things that don't get to the heart of this. They're not the real issues that government should be focused on. They're not the real fundamentals. And perhaps the current challenges being faced by Britain and by Scotland might help the governments to focus more on uh, on what's really important. So that might happen. Let's hope so. So giving children choices at school. If you want boys and girls do the same. Now, that's interesting. Because generally at school, boys and girls do do the same up to a certain age, and then an element of choice comes in. Uh, when I was at school, when I was at primary school, okay, I'm not that old, okay? I, I sometimes can hardly believe this happened, but it did. When I was in my final year of primary school, the uh, boys did science while the girls did needlework. Okay, the boys did science while the girls did uh, needlework. Uh, but that was surely the last school in Britain where that happened, and that was the last year it happened. I would imagine surely that didn't carry on uh, for much longer. So now, I mean, all pupils do study all subjects, so they get a flavour of them, and they have the opportunity to see what they're good at and to see what they like and see what fits in with their career ambitions. So I feel the system's about right in terms of when they make choices. I mean, the choices they make at age so 14, they're not particularly dramatic. You, you, well, with the National 5 system, I know a lot of schools, you don't actually do that many subjects. But if it's working properly, you're still doing you know eight subjects or so. So there's still a lot of flexibility. And going into the um, into the higher advanced higher, I think the degree of specialization there uh, is appropriate. So I, I, from my point of view, I would say that's already ha happens. They have a chance to study all subjects. Then they decide which ones to go forward with. Uh, right, let's, uh, let's go this. Uh, what do I like more worried about? Africa losing value by doctors or himself having to consult a black GP. I can't uh, speak for Mike, but I think the issue of third world countries losing medical staff is very significant. A few years ago, 12 African nations sent a joint letter to the UK government saying, can you please stop taking our medical staff to come and work in the NHS? And as I understand it, the response from the British government was, uh, no, no, we won't stop. You know, it's uh, we're, we're going to take uh, as many as you like. But it's a major problem for some poor countries. If you can barely afford to train, I mean, training medical staff is an expensive business. And if you're struggling to provide health care, that's, you know, that's a big investment you're making. Now, if you're making that investment in training medical staff and then they, they just disappear, then that's difficult. I suppose they could try and have legal restrictions, contracts that prevent people that they train from moving abroad. But I, I do think it is a, a genuine issue, certainly for uh, some African countries, they've been very concerned about it. Uh, we need more female engineers so there are not enough engineers. Yeah, that, that's sometimes the way it's presented, isn't it? You know, we're short of engineers. And the reason is that not as many, not enough girls are becoming engineers. Um, but, but that's just statistical jiggery pokery, isn't it? The fact that there's less girls than boys, that doesn't show that the problem is not enough girls doing engineering. I mean, if you need more... Um, more engineers, then basically you've got to improve the quality of your maths and scientific education through the school and then present the options, show the pupils what it involves, the career possibilities, and then one would hope that would look after itself. Right, I'll just take one more. I, I feel like going on for longer. I'll try and keep to time vaguely closely. Um, if you're part-time, you don't get paid a full-time wage. So why is equal pay uh, an issue. I think when they talk about the gender pay gap, it's normally comparing people uh, who are working full time. It's quite a complicated thing to measure, but they're normally comparing people who work full time. Um, but it is a fact, aside from that, uh, that women tend to work part time a lot more than men. And, and if men and women are working full time, men are more likely to work more overtime, whether, whether it's paid or unpaid. Men are more likely to work longer hours, but also more likely. Uh, to apply for dangerous jobs or, or uh, sort of dirty jobs. And also they're more willing to travel uh, to work as well, travel greater distances, and generally they're more willing to relocate as well for their career. So they're quite, quite um, distinct characteristics in general 
of the male and female workforce, which leads to the so-called gender pay gap. Um, right, uh, let's take one more. Um, Right, is this from the justice system? I haven't got those those to hand. I, I have been aware of that. I've heard about that. I've looked at those. Um, probably if you did some research on the internet, I would guess you, you'd find something about those. Um, yeah, I think there's things out there, plenty out there. Uh, okay. Uh, feminist politicians want 50-50 in the government and the boardroom, but not on fishing trawlers. Yeah, I mean, that's the way it always goes, isn't it? It's the top jobs that they think matter and, and the other jobs that the, the proportion doesn't matter. Uh, which fits in with the theory that it's not about equality. It's about, uh, often it's about promoting women like them. Because if you imagine yourself, you know, you, you're into politics and you want to get to the top, what's going to suit you? Well, you want policies that support women like you getting into the top jobs. So I, I think um, the policies of a lot of the politicians and parties, they reflect self-interest of the uh, the female politicians, I have to say. Uh, I keep saying one more, don't I? But let's uh, have a quick look. Um, right, let's... Uh, Let's uh, leave it there. We'll leave it there. Uh, so next week, we have a special guest. Oh, I can't remember who it is. So come on next week, and we will see who that is. Uh, we'll be having meetings around the country before too long. We'll, we'll probably try and have a, a sort of round of meetings in, in our various usual venues before the summer, so uh, through May uh, and June. It would be great to see you at any of those. Uh, but for this evening, I will say good night. <laughs>